Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tamara Rosevan. The March 23rd murder in broad daylight of former Russian MP and noted Putin critic Denis Voronikov shook the international community. Many viewed it as another warning for what could happen to those who speak out against the Putin regime. Joining me to discuss the impact of the killing is Russian politician Ilya Ponomarov, who gained international recognition for being the only Russian MP to vote against the annexation of Crimea. Welcome to the program. Hello. So, what does Veronikov's murder say about Putin's Russia? Uh, it says that uh, they would not stop on uh, murdering Litvinenko or Lesin or Berezovsky or Nemtsov. They would continue these tactics. And uh, uh, the president of Ukraine, uh, in his address to the nation, he said that it's an act of state terror. And I totally agree with him, but I think that it's important to understand that it's an act of state terror versus uh, Russian elite primarily, because the message that Putin wants to send is uh, don't switch sides, uh, don't go and, and help Ukrainians, don't go and ally with the West, that we will give, get you in whatever part of the world you will be. And um, a lot of media has portrayed it and have dubbed it as an assassination, an assassination of a Putin critic. Now, uh, do you truly believe that the Kremlin will murder people in order to silence Putin critics? No, actually, I don't see any other credible version, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Denis uh, was not involved in any kind of business activities. Um, he uh, knew virtually no one in, in Ukraine. He just arrived. Uh, I uh, know quite well all his state of things, and I was helping him uh, to file all the paperwork for Interpol, so I know quite deeply uh, what he is all about and uh, what is the state of his uh, uh, falsified criminal cases that were open against him in, in, in Russia. So I don't see any other motive. Uh, you know, theoretically, that could be uh, a revenge on behalf of uh, former president of Ukraine, because uh, uh, Voronenkov was testifying against him in the very high-profile case here, but uh, uh, that was unnecessary. and. Uh, Varanenkov's uh, uh, testimony was uh, not uh, the only evidence, and uh, by killing him, they are not uh, achieving anything. And uh, uh, if uh, the motive, uh, what I said, would be uh, to terrorize uh, the elites that are still in Russia, to terrorize uh, his uh, former uh, fellow parliamentarians, uh, that makes total sense. I see. Now, uh it's probably difficult for you to, to talk about the events of that day uh, when uh, uh, Mr. Voronkov was murdered in broad daylight in, in, in Kiev. Now, he was on his way to meet you. Yes. And um, you were supposed to meet to, to have a discussion about something to have. Um, what was the main idea? What were you going to talk about? Uh, we were going to talk about that uh, uh, Interpol request. Um, uh, Varanenkov was expecting that Russia would file a request for red notice for Interpol, and in such cases you usually write to Interpol uh, a kind of preemptive letter uh, to notify Interpol that there is a politically motivated uh, prosecution. You put uh, all the arguments to showcase that it's politically argument, uh, and, uh, politically motivated case, and uh, uh, you also provide uh, your current whereabouts so that please don't uh, search for us. We are here in Ukraine. The national I'm not, bureau. I'm not hiding from anybody. Exactly. Yeah, we are not hiding. Exactly. And and you've said to a lot of uh, media organizations that Veronikov had a lot of insider knowledge about how different financial schemes, uh, uh, Putin inside Putin's inner circle, how people there had some kind of schemes going going on, and how they were siphoning off money. Now, would you say that uh, this is valuable information that? could have been potentially used to uh, bring charges against individuals close to Putin? No, uh, you know, I think it's extremely valuable, and uh, it's uh, especially valuable in particular for Ukraine, uh, because as we know, the war in uh, eastern Ukraine and Donbas is being financed not officially through Russia's state budget. It's financed through uh, illegal financial schemes, through illegal activities, uh, through primarily smuggling uh, uh, events that, that are happening across uh, uh, Ukraine 
Ukrainian uh, and separatist uh, borders uh, through Russian territory to other countries. Uh, so uh, this knowledge about how this whole thing is uh, being organized, uh, who is in charge, uh, what are the particular banks, where are the accounts, who are the uh, placeholders. And he had all this information. Yeah, he, he had this information, yeah. Uh, he was in charge of uh, fighting against smuggling in Russia Federation for many years. So he knows the schemes. He knows the schemes that potentially were used to uh, funnel weapons and manpower into uh, eastern Ukraine, where uh, government troops are fighting Russian-backed forces right now. Right. Is, no, is what primarily, you're prim primarily how to uh, uh, channel money there and how to launder money which are going from that areas uh, to other parts of the world and whether uh, they, uh, this money is being used uh, to buy weapons uh, or ammunition or anything else, you know, that's, that's a second story. Has, has he passed or did he pass that information on to you? No. Did he pass it? Do you know of anybody else who could have obtained that information or is it lost forever now, basically? I don't know, but I'm afraid that most of it is lost. So this could have been a very key, uh, crucial aspect in Ukraine's case to prove that Russia is financing and bringing uh, soldiers into, uh, into uh, Donbass. You know, I think that, that, that in terms of uh, uh, proving uh, you know, Ukraine has plenty of different evidence, you know, there, there, there are pictures, uh, there is uh, evidence of people who saw that, uh, you know, so in terms of like uh, going to The Hague and uh, to other places and, uh, and proving the fact of aggression, uh, there is enough evidence. Uh, the question is how to disrupt uh, the war that is going there, how to stop, to fin stop financing. Uh, uh, this war, how to identify uh, uh, Ukrainians and Russians who are involved in this. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people from Ukraine uh, who are helping to finance the war and uh, finance the, uh, the separatism, and, and they need to be stopped. But uh, potentially, if, if, if you had that information about how these networks were being, uh, Russians were participating in these networks and which Ukrainian um, individuals were, were taking part of that, wouldn't you say that's a, a very crucial piece of, piece of evidence? that Ukraine would have benefited greatly from? Uh, very much so, especially that the war is hybrid. So I uh, said that many times that it's uh, worth several uh, brigades at, uh, at uh, the, the, the front line. I, I think that it was extremely valuable and I'm really sorry that it was uh, underappreciated and uh, that the government was as usual too slow uh, to react and to pick it up. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Now, um, coming, coming back to you. Now, um, if I have a, I have a quote here. Uh, famously, Putin said that enemies are right in front of you. You are at war with them. Now, uh, you can make an armistice with them, and it's all clear. Uh, but a traitor must be crushed. That's a very strong sen uh, uh, um, sentence. But um, how do you think? Putin views dissidents in in Ukraine. Do you think he views them as traitors, or do you see, or do you think he views them as more views them as um, enemies? No, different uh, people would be dif viewed differently. I think that in case of uh, Denis Voronenkov, it was absolutely uh, obviously uh, the definition of traitor because he was a military officer, uniformed person uh, who decided to switch sides, who assumed uh, Ukrainian citizenship. So I think that for uh, Putin's uh, crippled mindset, that's uh, the perfect definition of a traitor. Um, in regards to myself, I was his enemy from the day one. I was always in the opposition party. Uh, and I always was his open uh, critic and uh, played, so to say, by the rules. So I think that I am more in the, in the first category of, uh, of enemies. Um, I see. Now, uh, in 2012, uh, a Russian opposition activist was uh, kidnapped and um, taken to Moscow. He was he was kidnapped in Lviv. Um, he was he was later sentenced um, to uh, four four years in prison. Basically, he was he was an activist and um, he was my political aide. He was kidnapped in the center of Kiev and smuggled across the border four and a half years in prison. He is now in a camp in Siberia. He is about to be uh, released uh, this summer hopefully, so it's coming to the end, but nevertheless, he spent four and a half years in Siberian camp. Do you see him coming to Ukraine as well? Um, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, uh, Leonid, uh, as I know, is pretty critical uh, of uh, Maidan, 
uh, he thinks that it's uh, very much uh, driven by nationalists and uh, he's leftist and uh, he doesn't like that and uh, uh, that's why I'm not sure whether he would be coming here. I very much hope that Russian government would allow him in general to travel and that we will meet somewhere in Europe with him and with uh, other friends of mine, uh, uh, 10 of my political aides right now, they are under political asylum in uh, different countries and of course uh, you know we are meeting from time to time hopefully we'll see Leonid and Sergei Udaltsov and other jailed activists also with us. I see, and, and he's he's just one of several Putin critics who uh, who've, who've who've met uh, very um, difficult fates, and and there, there 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 were kidnappings and and murders, just as with Mr. Voronikov, and. Um, this makes a lot of people skeptical about how safe Ukrainian, the Ukrainian government can keep Russian dissidents. Now, um, have you had any thoughts about moving elsewhere, not staying in, in Ukraine? No, I, uh, uh, when I wound up being in the West uh, without a possibility to return for my country, and it was not a voluntary move from me, uh, on my on my behalf, I was just uh, uh, traveling on the business trip, and uh, Russian government uh, 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 revoked my right to cross the border, the national border of the country. So I couldn't physically uh, come back uh, uh, to Russia. And originally, I ended up being in the United States because I was like literally penniless. I need to make some money just uh, just to survive. So my first year was in the United States. And uh, I was consciously uh, wanting from the very beginning to come here to Ukraine. So I moved to Ukraine because I feel like being in Ukraine, I am uh, useful. And I think that uh, the best thing that I can do for my country is to make uh, Ukraine successful and to prove to my uh, constituents that uh, revolution will bring prosperity and freedom um, if uh, that would happen uh, uh, back home or in, in, in my country. So for me, it was a very conscious choice. And I don't think that Ukraine is uh, way more dangerous than other places. Uh, unfortunately, many of my friends were murdered in other countries. Uh, uh, my friend Alexander Litvinenko or Boris Berezovsky, they were murdered in uh, London, being protected by MI6. Or my, definitely not my friend, but the person whom I knew, Mikhail Lesin, who defected uh, from Russia to United States, was under protection of FBI and was murdered in the center of Washington, D.C. So even uh, being under protection of most powerful uh, security services in the world does not help. So I better be here at war uh, and, and fight for peace and freedom. I see. Uh, very nice. But um, what kind of message would you have for um, those that don't potentially wish you the best in Russia, who see you as a traitor, who see you as an enemy? What kind of message do you, do you, do you, do you have for them? My message is very uh, simple. The history will tell. And uh, I think that... Uh, uh, the most unpatriotic government we ever have, we, this is the one which is currently uh, uh, at power uh, in Moscow. And I think that everybody who is calling me traitor, and most of them are real patriots, they are just disoriented by state propaganda. When this propaganda would disappear, they will realize where we are and who is the real friend of Russia and who is the real foe. I see. Now, uh, the the recent protests in uh, Moscow, um, uh, there was a lot of young young people who who came out and who uh, basically these were people in their early twenties uh, who were te who are teens and who who've never uh, lived who to who who've never seen a different president other than Putin basically. Right. And and uh, there's been a lot of media speculation about how these how these protests, how they will develop and whether it will stick, whether whether this will make a change and whether the message will be heard across across Russia, because obviously they were in various various cities, 99 cities, Navalny called for right. for protests across 99 cities. Now, would you say that they're going to be su successful? Uh, does Putin have something to worry about? No, of course he has to worry about. And he has to worry about even without those protests, because uh, the way uh, he leads the, uh, the country, he provokes the uh, social unrest and social explosion. Because uh, people are not living uh, uh, any better. Uh, uh, they are suffering. Uh, the feeling of social injustice within the country is growing. Right now he is feeding um, uh, them uh, with uh, all these aggressive rhetorics.
but uh, you cannot replace food with bombs. And uh, I think it's inevitable that young generation in particular, who is uh, less poisoned uh, with this propaganda at the end of the day, will stand up and say, uh, Mr. President, it's time to go. And uh, uh, I think that we saw right now that uh, the passion is there, uh, that the desire uh, to come and to speak is there. Um, and whether it would be Navalny or somebody else, or whether it would be just, you know, a leaderless grassroots protest, of course, that would lead uh, inevitable to, to the change in the country. I see. Very strong, a strong message, um, no doubt. Um, thank you so much for joining me today in the studio. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, you were watching an interview with Mr. Ilya Ponomarov. He's a, uh, a Russian, he's a former um, Russian MP and uh, a pol politician. And uh, you're watching UATV.